he wants to jump. 1,000 cars. Sir, you have a 1,000 cars. I don't think I'd attempt to try this stunt. Or we, we owe this horsepower to Uncle Sam. <laughs> Too many car. car. You know, roses would be... Uh... Like, I put my beer belly on it. Yeah. You can't immediately tell somebody how many cars you have. You'll really give those uppity yuppies something to think about. Stay on the bar. Don't go yeah. off the bar with your Bronco. 1980 Volvo horns. What's right? Me, me. Yeah. Only the man's coolant. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I thought it'd be small. It's for a small car. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's still an automatic transmission. They're never going to be light. It's definitely going to have to crash. Starting off with Brad buying another car. That's the West. <laughs> Internet. You know, is this a Nigerian oil print? Uh, I also wish you drove a tan Camry. Anyways, anyway, that, that's a horrible, very horrible podcast content. A very a inside joke. All right, welcome to Auto Off Topic. How are you, Brad? I, Andrew, am pretty good. Yourself? I'm great. I just got back from another Trek night in America. Mr. Race Car Driver over there. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, the last time we missed last week. So the, the last time we recorded was like the day after, I think, not the night of. The day but... after your last track day. Yeah. Yeah. You we were away last week, right? So we didn't record. And then I don't know what happened. But anyway, yeah. Doesn't so matter. Now, another track day. Yep. It was at Lime Rock again, which uh, it was kind of. Like normally it's like pretty pretty quiet, and pretty sleepy on a like a Thursday at Lime Rock, but grid life is this weekend, so they're actually they're doing load in like while we we're doing the track night. So like all the grid life stuff was getting set up. Like the Falcon tire trailer was there and some of the drift cars were there already and all the FCP Euro stuff. Because I'm going to drift I'm going not drift life. I'm going to grid life too on yep. uh, Saturday. So it's kind of, it's kind of silly. I like drove out to Lime Rock. I'm going to drive out to Lime Rock again on Saturday. Yeah, uh, is what it is. And then I bought tickets to Watkins Glen. Cause I said, screw it. I want to go see a NASCAR race. And the other race I wanted to go to in HMS was rained out. Uh, and I want to see a road course. So I'm just going to, sure. the race isn't until like three in the afternoon. So if I leave it like 6 a.m., six hours look at there around noon hang out watch the race just come right back another six you're not hours. gonna spend the night there nope hmm just do, do you remember turnaround. last time we did that what was the last time we did that uh, it was many 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 years ago like 2010 or 11 and we went to new jersey motorsports park for a rallycross and we drove oh, right. back the same day and we were ready to m- murder ourselves on the way back because it was too much. We and got we stuck in 10, Jersey Shore traffic. We were 10 years younger then, Andrew. It here's the thing. We were we spent 3 to 4 hours years, 13 years younger. Oof, it took us so it took ago. us th- it, it's not normally a 6-hour drive. That's like a lot closer, I think. It is a lot closer, but you're doing a 6-hour drive this time. So you're doing that amount no. of I'm sorry. That is a six hour drive normally, but we got stuck literally in New Jersey for three to four hours on the turnpike because it's the Jersey shore and was a a Saturday or a Sunday uh, in August. Sure. I thought it caught this is out in the middle of nowhere. You're just on like I-90. All right. I hope you're not going alone. I'm not. Uh, Stephanie's coming. Okay. And her dad's coming to visit. And he's a NASCAR fan. So we're bringing him. Okay. That makes sense. And his boy, Chase Elliott, needs a win. He does. And it's a road one. course. I mean, he almost yep. got one last week. We can jump into that in a little bit, but he was pretty close. So we'll see. That should be pretty crazy. Um, Because, like, all right, we'll jump into it. Anyway, let me go back to the track night. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll talk about NASCAR because the, the race was pretty cool last week, too. So, yeah, track night, Lime Rock, use the G20 again. Um, yeah, it, that's, this is the you first Lime Rock I've been to. I, I feel like I made improvements in, in the past week. Oh, yeah, I did. Um, so I actually, yeah, it was like a week and a half ago. It was my birthday. I had the day off. 
and I got some speakers to the back of the G20 because they're all blown out. I had to take the whole tray off, the rear package tray. And I had that structure bar hanging around, which I couldn't put it in because the package tray was in the way. And I was like, well, I'm not going to do that unless I have speakers at the same time. So I got the speakers, just like $50 speakers. Because the factory ones were totally, the cones were just gone. Just disintegrated. And they weren't I mean, that great when I got the car. And then It's a 95 yeah. car and it's 2023, so that makes sense. Uh, what a rip off. Don't build them like yeah. they used to. <laughs> yeah. Um, open up the trunk like recently and like there was foam in there. I was like, where does this foam come from? And I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, this is speaker cone foam. Like, <laughs> like it just like the foam, you know, it's like paper on a factory speaker. It's like paper with like the foam sure. at the edge. The yeah. paper was still there. The foam was gone. So like the, the cones were not connected. It was so kind of really, hard. really good, you know, good working speakers. So like, the magnet will just move them, but they're just open to air or just sounded not like push, not push everything sounded like 1930s AM announcers. Yeah, there's still some crackling in there and maybe it's the front speakers are bad. I got to take a door panel off and measure them. I'll throw some in. I don't know. It sounds better. It's not great. Sometimes you're driving down the road, listen to it, and it sounds like. I'm like, oh, no, there's stuff hitting the windshield. But no, it's the speakers popping. Oh, it's no secret that neither of us have ever been giant audio guys. So I don't really care if I just get the crackle out of it It would be a little less annoying. But I've never even had a car with any kind of actual bass in the stereo system until I bought a car from Jordan here who puts bass in everything. So. I now have cars with subwoofers in them, but it uh, was never a thing I even thought about. Now that I have it, I'm like, oh, this is cool. I like this. Good good audio is nice to have. So, but yeah, no, it's I don't. good enough. Crackling is I could, too. I listened to some podcasts on my way to my track night with my AC on. It's quite nice. That's a beautiful thing. Now, the AC in that car is quite effective. It is. Um, Kind of annoyingly, i pretty sure I replaced the wipers and it started to sprinkle a little bit. I must have got something on them from when I was detailing it. And I'll talk about that because like it, they just like smeared like so bad. I was like, almost couldn't see. I was like, these are like brand new wipers I put on like two months ago. But anyway, um, yeah, it was like overcast, but it didn't rain. Uh, it was a lot like, like in the seventies. Um, so yeah, it was a, cause the last track day was like in the nineties. Um, yeah, that's a bit, a bit warm. Yeah. It was a lot more comfortable at Lime Rock. Um, and yeah, it's the first time I went to Lime Rock since going to the Nürburgring. And yeah, I feel like that helped again. Like I was cruising pretty fast in like fourth gear instead of like third gear. Like, like almost top of fourth through most of it. And, um, and where you normally were in top of third. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot like, faster than like repeatedly across the start finish line over a hundred miles an hour. All right. That's fast. It's very fast. I, I, I need to look at the video and just do a rough time calculation because i was before i was around like a 110 you know if it's like a 105 like that'd be pretty cool that's a pretty good that's a pretty good drop just from i mean really you can't say that the strut bar did that that's (laughs) that's just skill improvement no that's like looking for the apexes trying to let the car track out and not turn the wheel too much and scrub speed um, like, yeah, just like really trying to carry momentum. I mean, I was, there was like about a half a lap. I have it on video of, of me just chasing down a C5 Corvette through that S's section in the front. And then of course they blast me on the straight, but I'm like definitely catching them <laughs> through the twisties. It's awesome. So. 
Um, that's awesome. That's a huge improvement. So it's good. It's good to hear. So much so that I seemingly use more fuel than I'm used to. And like the last session I was going out and the, the gauge was starting to get really low. And I was like, well, I'm like five or 10 minutes into this. It's no big deal. I do it enough that if I don't get 10 minutes of a session here, I don't want to run out of gas. Yeah, that'd be annoying because there's not a gas station right there. Well, there's gas. There is on one in the paddock, premises. but it's it's probably like $6 a gallon. Also, it's normal Phoenix rising. Yeah. But I actually, when I went to leave, I took a left out of there and like 10 minutes away, there's a gas station. It's like closer than the other gas stations. So I was like, oh, I didn't know that. That's not too bad. So you don't have to worry about it quite as much. No. Um, There's some road construction around there that I got to watch out for. I want to go back. So Saturday, I'm going to go back. Uh, I'm going to try to get the talent out of the garage. I haven't really driven that this year. I think that'd be a cool car to take to grid life. Absolutely. Cause I was like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to drive the G20 again. It's cool, but I don't want to drive it again. Sure. And hopefully Plus the, the weather having multiple cars is to use multiple yeah. cars. Yeah. And hopefully the weather's not too hot. Cause the town definitely does not have any AC. Correct. And I would I'd probably have taken the Q, uh, not the Q45, the Gallant. But I forgot to get a sticker for it. Does it count? Yeah, because I did it in October, okay. last October. So it's valid. Yeah, I, I, I'd say it's worth the risk, except that you're on the bike. So it's not because you definitely get. No, it's the not because it's all state yeah. police. Yeah, definitely um, the and they were they were out tonight. So yeah, and I was just like, I don't have a time to get ticket, one. But it's also two points in your license. So it's yeah. just not worth it. Um, plus the car kind of needs an alignment. I think I don't know. It was whatever. I'm like, I'll just drive the talent. I haven't driven the talent in so long. Let's just drive it. It's it's like, it's got good like grid life vibes, right? It's, it's sure. low now. I got HREs it's on low. it. It's on H. It's on, it's on stance boy wheels. It's good to go. Yeah, like nobody ever sees DSMs. I'll be. I'll have so many kids coming up to me, being like, "What is this?" <laughs> Uh, if it's anything like the kids that come yeah. to me when I'm in the eclipse, they're going to say, what is this, a Saturn? Yeah. I'm going to, um, I'm going to roll up. How do you do fellow kids? Yeah. Hello youth. Yeah. <laughs> I too am youth. Yeah. Uh, you need the, what's his name? The actor there. You just put a skateboard over your shoulder and. Yeah. Steve Buscemi. Like belong. So yeah, there you go. Steve Buscemi. Um, I think the grid life crowd, because we've been to a grid life event. We went to the, and you've been to this one last year, right? It's a good mixed crowd. Yeah, it's a pretty good mixed crowd. It's not just kids. It's a good, uh, it's a good bunch of the, um, God, are we middle age? I guess we're middle age. Oh, there's a good are. bunch of, good bunch of middle age people there. Uh, I'm excited because I, unfortunately we missed it last year, but, and, and all the other ones have never been in New England, so you know, the, the Atlanta one was cool. Um, sure. But I'm like, yeah, man, this is great. Well, I like what they did with this one is that they really went for like the. The like 70s through like 2000s like era of cars. OK, because it's because it's grid life circuit legends. So they're doing like they have a curated concourse area. With all, you know. To, quote unquote tutor cars. I but if it's anything long. like this, it's not nice enough. The paint's not nice yes, enough. It is. No, nah, it's, it's you're, you're killing yourself again because that car is a it's not perfectly nice. period correct car. Uh, it's it's not as nice as some of these cars I've seen in pictures. So it's not. But also, so I'm curious when you're there on Saturday to look at these cars up close, and I bet that up close they're no. Some of them are probably nicer, but I bet a lot of them are nicer than your car. So maybe. But either way, your car has all the cool period parts on it. It would definitely be a cool retro import car kind of thing. So that's cool. They they're doing that up on that hill that's over the front straight. Like you'd be coming down the front stretch on the left side. Yeah. So if you're standing okay. on the big hill that overlooks the S's. Yep. And you looked over to your left. The hill that's in the outfield. Yeah, there's normally nothing there, so that's good. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. 
Um, they're doing like a bunch of different races. They're doing drifting. I'm like, I'm really excited to check it out. And it's cool to see that Lime Rock is doing young person stuff. Young to middle aged person stuff. Yes. <laughs> I wonder what a plane ticket costs to get there tomorrow. Probably too much money now. Kind of want to go. But jealous. what? Uh, yeah, our buddy Steve Booten's going to be there too. And I have media for Auto Off Topic. So. Oh, good. I don't know exactly what that means. Well, it's it means like, that I expect pictures. Yeah, I mean, you could do it without media, too. I don't... Lime Rock's, like, not... That's the great thing about Lime Rock, is that it's really good access. Well, I wonder if it'll get you to, like... You, the way you see a lot of media people sometimes in the outside of... After you go through the S's, the outside of... What is that? Turn 4 right there? It, it doesn't get me trackside. Oh. Yeah, I don't know what it gets because you. Because you had to be, like on assignment or something silly and it's like whatever this is like i have the influencer one. Ah, oh, okay so you know we're like vlogger influencers so we need to make splash graphics for the next episode and you'll never believe sure. what happened when andrew went to grid life yeah um no it looks it looks really really cool i and I don't know. I was. I don't even know. Like I, I lost my train of thought of what I was trying to talk about with like. Oh, you know what it was. So, I remember, and you'll remember this too. Like the nopey stuff, like sure, twenty years ago, right? More than twenty years I, ago. Yes. It was probably like ninety nine to like two thousand five. I think it was still going on after that. Yeah, it, it may have. It was falling off though. But like, it's got that vibe, but with something that's like a thing I actually want to go to. It has that vibe minus the cheesiness. I I think right? honestly, because it I'll... has it has the motorsport part. Yeah, and like the music stuff is also fun. Oh, that's the other crazy thing. So I don't know if you saw Grid Life's Instagram post apparently T-Pain went to the one that we went to in 2018 in Atlanta Yep, and was in- introduced to drifting. And now he's in, he's yes. been into drifting ever since, and he's going to be drifting did, Saturday. Did you, not, at did you not know that? I did not know that T-Pain was into drifting. Okay. So when we were there in 2018, uh, he was there as I think a guest of killer Mike. Okay. Uh, who was also that makes there. sense. Yep. Um, and he got Atlanta. big into drifting there. And then there, well, because Killer Mike uh, did the music at Grid yep. Life 2018. Um, and then he got big into drifting. And then last year, there was a huge, like, contra- controversy about some major drift shop that was helping him work on his car and, like, basically stole it and had it forever. He oh, has I didn't the, know that. Yeah, it's a whole thing. A whole thing. Like, he was like, listen, I haven't said anything about this. It's been like eight months and I'm finally saying something about it because I want my car back. Uh, he has the the Pickle Rick liveried uh, S14 Nissan. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, he's pretty big into this. It's, not, it's, been, it's definitely no secret. I'm, I'm surprised you never heard it. I don't know how that got past you. I, I don't, I'm not if, a if, big T. Like, I don't listen to T Pain. My wife I loves T Pain. I don't listen to T-Pain either, but I knew all this just from, I don't know. You're, you're already failing at trying to blend in with the youth, Andrew. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> you're, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Who is this? Mr. T. Yes. Panini? T. Dot pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who who uh, T. Panini on track? No, it's uh, a, <laughs> uh, yeah, your, your, your influencer youth cred <laughs> is going out the window. I'm going to revoke your media pass, I think. So, no, anyway, yeah, T-Pain has been in drifting for a while. There was actually some stuff on Hoonigan a while back because uh, um, Hurt was helping him learn how to drift down in Florida. So uh, Apparently, I think Hurt will be there tomorrow, too. I don't see. I don't yep. really watch any of this YouTube stuff. I just know it ancillary from like you. Sure. Yeah, I don't watch all their YouTube stuff either. Only stuff that I know I'd be interested in, but um He's a pretty, I've actually, I've had the pleasure of meeting him uh, once and he's actually a super nice guy. So it kind of left an extra impression on me. So 
But anyway, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a little jealous you're going. I kind of want to go. And there's no grid life out here. So that's uh, that's cool. That's a cool event. So I just looked a flight up. It's 300 bucks round trip. I could make it there. Oh, Ryan Turek is bringing that uh, Toyota truck that you saw at SEMA. Yeah, the Stout, the 70 or 69 Stout. Yeah. That'll be, that'll be cool to see actually all done and running. I saw it parked. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see it moving. Um, Ryan Turek's actually in the process of, they just closed on some land up in New Hampshire. I don't know if you I saw that. Yet. Yeah, and they're building like a drift uh, land? Dedicated, dedicated drift track up there. Yep. New England, all of a sudden, the motorsports capital of America. <laughs> well, they, a lot of the tracks, like um, Lime Rock, set up like a drift area at the top with like FCP yep. Euro. But I don't think they do like a lot of drifting there. I could be misspeaking. Thompson definitely does drifting all the time. I keep meaning yep. it down there. Just haven't had the time. Because it looks cool, because they do like Friday night ones, but that requires trying to fight through Boston traffic to get there on a Friday night. Yeah, you'd have to take a half a day and go midday just to be the traffic. Um, and they used to do parking lot drifting at HMS. I don't know why they don't do that anymore, but I think everybody kind of moved to Thompson. I think Thompson's really the only place that's been doing it. But anyway, it's pretty cool. I. Say what you will about it. It looks cool. It's got different. It's just a different atmosphere. It's the way I always describe it to people that are like, don't understand what drifting is, but maybe understand what skateboarding. I'm like, it's the same sure. thing. It's the same. Yeah. The same kids that were skateboarding are now driving drift cars because they can drive. Yeah. The only, the only the same thing I don't like vibe. about drifting. The only thing I don't like about drifting is the, the people who just really don't care about the car. And they just go out there to smash things and have a bet. And, you know, be yeah. Ridiculous. But there's the majority, that, but there, there's the majority a lot of really of nice drift cars. <laughs> yeah, the majority of people aren't into that. That just happens to be what you see most of, unfortunately. But most people can't afford to do that. You know, so people talk about amateur drifters all the time. Like, what are they in it for? They're not in it for money because it costs them money. You know, a, a full drift weekend, it's going to cost you a thousand bucks probably by the time you get gas and transportation and tires and lodging and you know, it's and registering for the event. It's not. It's not a cheap, cheap thing. It's not like going out an autocross or doing a track day. It's, it's very expensive. So it's not smashing your car is not ideal. So unless you have disposable income and don't care, then it's different. But people no, but... that truly do good drifting are are cool to watch, and I'd like to try it sometime. I don't want to go out there and like proximity run walls, but I'd like to just go out there in a big open area and just practice transitions back and forth. There's a bunch of really nice drift cars around here, though. For sure. And again, back to back to Grid Life in 2018, when we were watching the Pro Drifters, like that was really cool. Yeah, that was wild. Because those cars are like you know a thousand horsepower with grip. Yep. Yeah, watch that. That's what it takes that, to drift. That that hill, the back hill there on Road Atlanta, that 90 degree left hander was pretty wild. Yeah. So. And. I'm telling you, when you watch a car do like like tandem drifts, really, really cool. Yep. Like it's far more impressive in person than when you're watching videos of it. Yeah, no question. And I think it's more impressive watching people do it like that than watching the, you know, FD stuff on television because it's the FD stuff on television is so clinical. Like it's a short little section. Every car runs exactly the same line, exactly the same way because they have to get all the exact same points. And it's just, I don't know, it just it feels it feels too clinical and I'm also more into, obviously, just like anything else, I'm not as into the thousand horsepower, quarter million dollar build. I'm more into the guy who does it on a weekend and has, you know, three or 400 horsepower. <laughs> so it's more fun to watch that to me. But anyway, no, again, I'm stoked you're going. I'm jealous I'm not. And I uh, will be glued to my phone this weekend looking at uh, pictures and videos from everybody going there. So while we're talking about motorsports, I might as well talk about NASCAR. Sure. So the road Indy course was at Indy week. last week. Yep. Traditionalists yeah. be damned. I enjoy it immensely. Um, and it's fine. They don't run the Brickyard 400 anymore. Yeah, I thought they still ran it. And then this was just extra. But I guess they decided to do this instead. 
Yeah, last year they switched to just the road course. There's no more Brickyard. Interesting. Yeah, the traditionalists are pretty upset about it because they don't like road courses. But I don't know. I think it's cool. It's something different. And they still get to go to Indy. It's still no less legendary or important as a road course, I don't think, than as an oval. Because they're not open wheel cars anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, oh, I have a question. Okay. Since you were at Indy, were they going in the opposite direction of the oval? On the road course, they were, yes. Okay. So the oval normally goes counterclockwise like every other oval, left-hand turns. Yes. On the road course, it goes the opposite direction. Okay. Clockwise. That's what I thought. Yep. Was it? You were seeing them come out towards the start finish line. I'm like, I feel like that's on the wrong side. Yes. Yep, it is. Interesting. I don't know if that's just the way the road course is laid out or... I mean, most road courses are clockwise though, right? I'm trying to think. You're on Lime Rock clockwise. Yeah, it's clockwise. Yeah, I think most road courses are clockwise. Thompson's clockwise. NHMS is counterclockwise because you run part of the oval. Yeah, you're right. You do. And Daytona is counterclockwise. Yep. No. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Yep. So, but dedicated road courses, I think, are usually clockwise. Uh, like the Nurburgring is clockwise, right? No, it's counterclockwise. I think this is a deep dive we'll have to go into. No. At some point. Um, No, it's clockwise. Sorry. On the map. It's clockwise, right? Yeah. 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 Because when you're looking at it, you you head towards the south part of it first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think most. Laguna Seca is counterclockwise. Huh. All right, well, uh, put a pin in this. We're going to have to go into a, a little bit of research and to find out what determines which way a racetrack is run. And it could just be the way it's laid out. You know, the, the corners might not make sense going the opposite direction, so they just do it the other way. That could be it. Yeah, and like Circuit de la Sarth, so Le Mans is clockwise. Clockwise. Weird. Yep. Anyway, we'll have to do a... Uh, um. A deep dive and to figure out why they Road Atlanta that way. clockwise. Huh. All right. Funky. Well, anyway, it was a really cool race at Indy. I, I thought the first and second stages were pretty. First stage was definitely pretty wild. Um, second stage calmed down a bit. And then it's interesting, too, that they I feel like. The first road course they ran this year at Coda. I feel like they did the competition yellow and then they decided not to do it for the rest of them. Is that right? They're not doing any competition yellows for road courses. But I thought they did it for the first one at Coda. And then they were like, yeah, that's dumb. Don't do it. Yeah, I don't I don't remember if they did Coda or not. But I know that what I've noticed as at this this year, they haven't done. So end of stage breaks and no. So no competition yellow in the beginning. And then no stage break yellows. Every stage, just the race keeps going, regardless yep. of the stage ending or not. In fact, so this race here, so there was talk of them not doing the road course at Indy this year because last year it was such a crash fest. Um, but this year it was the exact opposite. There was one yellow for a crash the whole entire race. It was no, it was a, a super, really clean race, like super fast a, race. like Super clean race, yeah. Super clean race. I was, I was actually like, I was hoping for a yellow in the end. I'm not, yeah. I'm not anti um, McDowell. You know, he's actually the uh, local Phoenix driver. Um, but I'm also like pro Chase Elliott and Daniel Suarez, who were second and third. And I really wanted one of them to have a chance. And McDowell was so far ahead of them that there was no way they were going to catch him unless they got a yellow. But it uh, didn't happen. So, and then like, Early on, like SVG wasn't too bad, but apparently he had something wrong with the car, like the throttle yep. was sticky or something. Yeah, he definitely was not. Uh, 
wasn't the the force to be reckoned with like he was in Chicago. But I thought Kobayashi was like, I think he got beat up. Like he, I think he hit a couple of people, and a couple of people hit him back. So one thing that seemed to be happening was that the guest drivers, the ones who were not NASCAR drivers, if they got a little bit aggressive, um, the NASCAR drivers were like, "All right, just like that's stop we're gonna play it. Forget about it. You're all done." Um, Kobayashi was fast, but he had a couple of. I think I can remember two moments he had going to turn one where he just did not get a bunch of people had enough. turn one issues. Yeah, well, much less than last year. Um, he had a couple issues in turn one where he couldn't get woed down enough and he hit a couple drivers and the retaliation came swift and quick. And uh, I think he finished like 33rd or 34th, unfortunately. But the Toyota he was driving, he had the um, GR Racing North America livery Toyota. And it was a really good looking race car out there. So it was neat to see. But I think he's actually run, he's run NASCAR before. Yeah. Somewhere. So that was cool to see. And there was another driver from touring cars who just kind of was mid to back of the pack all day. I don't remember what it was. So yeah, the uh, guest hot shoe drivers weren't really as, um, I don't want to say impressive, but they didn't really. Oh, Jensen Button was there too. Yep. And he finished. I was, I, I mean, I really, I was really pulling for Suarez because he had the pole. His car was super fast at the beginning. Yep. But yeah, he got screwed a little bit in the pits. Yeah, he he drove over the uh, airline. Yeah, he drove over it and stopped the car right on top of the airline. So when the tire changer went from right to left, he had to back the car up over the airline, unfortunately, which, you know, that those extra 10 seconds that takes are enough to yep. take you right out of contention, especially if there's no yellows. Like I said, I really want to see Elliot get in the playoffs, and I'd really like to see Suarez you know, win the race, but unfortunately it didn't happen. Actually, well, right so, now, so it's like in the playoffs as well, too. So I guess like McDonald was a spoiler a bit. Like he, put, he was, there's three more regular season races, three or two, maybe three, maybe, maybe two. So it put Suarez closer to getting into the playoffs. Yes. Bumped Bubba Wallace down because he was just trying to hold on apparently during this race. And just not lose points. Like yeah, just he's maintain. not a great road course racer, self-admittedly to himself. Which is funny because the first time I heard of him, they were at like Road America in like a Bush Series race in the rain. Yep. And he was doing pretty good running in well, front of everyone, but just getting really sideways. good against other Bush, against the next tier down of drivers. And yeah. Not quite, not quite there with the NASCAR guys, the cup car guys. So Bubba Um, and Bubba and Daniel are on either side of the cut line. Yeah. So you have Bubba's in Fort is, uh, in, I guess 16th. Yeah. 16th and 17th. And they are only 28 points apart from one another. Yeah. And then you've got Chase Elliott who hasn't won a race at all this season. So he's trying to missed five or six races this season. Seven races they were talking about. Seven races. I thought it was a lot because he was injured and then he had a penalty. Yeah. So he missed a bunch of races. And despite that fact, he's only third down on the cut line, down by 80 points. So theoretically, if Wallace, Suarez, and Ty Gibbs all have a really bad days for the next two weeks and Chase Elliott has really good days, theoretically, he can still get in, but 80 points is a huge gap. So. It- I thought they said mathematically, just like points are impossible. I feel I feel like they said that during the broadcast. Like he has to have a win. I don't think it's impossible yet, because he's. Yeah, I guess it, I guess it would be, because you can't you can't lose points, right? Unless you have some kind of weird penalties. So, yeah, that wouldn't work, because the most points you can get is what twenty. I guess. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it works. It must be two or three more races left because they've had 14 winners. So what are they, do they do like a bracket of 16? I don't know how the playoffs work. It's a bracket of 16. Yep. Because and they said SVG is not eligible. Correct, because he's not a regular driver. Yep. You have to run. I forget how many races in order to to be there. So. 
So they must do, so it must be, because if it's, four, if there's 13 eligible drivers, it must be like two more races, I feel like, and then whoever's above the cut line probably gets in and they make 16. It's three more races. Three more races? Three more All races. Right. Oh, so the, two more races. You were right. I'm reading it wrong. Yeah. So yeah, two more races. The, there's the go bowling at the Glen, which yep. is what you're going to. And then the formerly much better named race, but it's now the Coke Zero Sugar 400 at uh, Daytona. So it used to be the Coca Cola 600, wasn't it? Uh, the Coca Cola 600 is at Charlotte. I oh. Think? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, that we've talked about that. That is the same yeah. day or as Indy. Yeah, same weekend as Indy. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah, like Coco Six are the same day as Indy. That's um, Memorial Day, not Labor Day. Look, I got it right for once. You did. Me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, go bowling at the Glen is the next race, which is the Watkins Glen race that you're going to, and then the Coke Zero Sugar <laughs> Four Hundred, which used to be the Coca Cola Four Hundred, um, is at Daytona. The following week on Saturday, Which, it's a, that's a night race on Saturday. So that's cool. That's admittedly, the go bowling at the Glen is a great name for a race. Because it's a terrible name, wrecks. but a good name. I don't know what go bowling is. I assume it's some sort of like national bowling promotional company or something. But yeah, they're trying to bring bowling back. I yeah. don't know. Whatever. Bowling is a great sport. I'm into it introduce candle pin to the rest of the country and you'll have something. I really think so. Anybody who's been to New England and has gone candle pin bowling has enjoyed it. Yep. I think it's more fun than 10 pin bowling personally. It's more fun to chuck that little softball size bowling ball a thousand miles an hour than it is to lug around a 12 pound 10 pin ball. Yeah. So anyway, at the Glen... Um, yeah. I got tickets for turn 11 grandstands of bowling with <laughs> off topic. Um, okay. So I was wondering how it worked there. It's not like lime rock. You have actual seats. Uh, you can get general admission that have no assigned seats. <clears throat> okay. But you can also buy seats and still walk around. So I was like, why don't I buy some seats? These are turn 11. So it's the turn right before start finish. So hopefully okay. there's action there. But I also intend to walk around a bit and check it out. Has anyone yeah, been there before? Be, it'll be neat. To, it'll be neat to see. I've never been to a NASCAR road race event, so that'll be. Uh, that'll no, be I have not. I have not done that. So, no. yeah. Wait, both of us have talked about going to Watkins Glen since we started this podcast, or since before we started this podcast. Huh? I know, and I was just like, you know what? I'm doing it. And yeah. I Did it? Bought some tickets, and we're doing it. Yeah, it worked the out track that... map has zero like spectator spots around like half the track. So I wonder how much of that you can walk. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And you know, my father-in-law is visiting and he's a NASCAR guy. I was like, all right, he'll enjoy it. Yep. Yep. And uh, it looks like turn 11 grandstands pretty good. Cause you get to see turn 10 and turn 11 from your seat. Yeah. Whereas if you were on like the main straight, you wouldn't get to see much. Exactly. So. Uh, and you can probably see down to turn one from there. Probably. Yep. And yeah. And like, you know, my father-in-law has never been to a NASCAR road course race either. So sure. He's been to the Phoenix race. I know that. Yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. I'm into it. So I'm jealous of your next two weekends in a row. Actually, <laughs> I want to go to both these events. I'm going to have to try to get tickets to Sonoma or something next year so I can go see a road course race. Anyway, so yeah. To, I keep to, forgetting that you're like on the West Coast sometimes, and I'm like, oh, man, that'd be cool to go to that event. And then I'm like, oh, yeah. After it goes by, I'm like, Brad's out there. We could have just maybe yeah. we can. Well, you it. planned on doing a bunch of stuff here in October, and I haven't heard whether you want to come out or not. So, Assuming Yeah, that- what do you get going on in October? So we have a bunch of stuff. We have Radwood here in Phoenix. We have... Actually, I think it starts the week, the last weekend in September. September, possibly, yes. There's, there's Radwood here in Phoenix. There's the Williams 
vintage Japanese event here in Phoenix. And we have the Prescott rally all in like a three week period, three or four week period. You said them in reverse order. Okay. So I'm terrible with dates as everybody who listens would know. So at the Prescott rally, we have the Williams 20th, 29th of September. Yep. Um, which I'm only going to Saturday, unfortunately, just because I started a new job. I don't want to take a day off already, but I'm already taking a trip myself at the end of the month. So I can't, I definitely can't make that one. Okay. And then we have off the podcast. Okay. And then uh, we have Williams. Oh, I don't even know. I should probably get these dates right. Yeah. It's so Williams, I think, is the following weekend. I've been looking it up, but I'll let you look it up. Why don't you look it up real fast? So it's the Williams. It's the same weekend, unfortunately, as Japanese classic car, classic car show, show. Yep. in Long Beach. So it's October but 6th and 7th. Been in that a couple of times now, luckily. So I would rather well, there's, there's, see the Williams a, show. There's a, there's a good reason for it. The event is the same weekend every year in Williams. Williams is this tiny little sleepy town in northern Arizona that's up in the woods along the original Route 66. It was actually the the last town to be bypassed on Route 66. So it has that going. Oh, so forward. this is has, Radiator Springs. It's 100% Radiator Springs. It has all the little tchotchke shops and the diners <laughs> and all of the, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s Americana in this little town. And we take it over every year as the, you know, JDM classic. There's other car shows up there during the year. They have like a hot rod day and a muscle car day and all this kind of stuff up there. So it's the same weekend every single year and they don't change it. And they have all their sponsors in the town. Everybody supports it. And they shut down all this, all the parking downtown for, for the old cars. So they couldn't change the weekend. So when JCCS announced their date as the same date, the organizers of both events are actually friendly and they had a conversation. And the reason JCCS changed their date was because the town of Long Beach was like, no, this is the date you can have. Take it or leave it. So unfortunately, it's just the way it's going to be this year. Next year, it won't be the same way again. So the only thing that's making me a little bit nervous about it is I don't know if it's going to affect attendance at the Arizona show or not, because JCCS is obviously a larger event. I just think that it might uh, affect it a little bit. But anyway, so yeah. Where are you getting people from California? We're not getting that many people from California. We do get some Um, people come from as far as Oregon to go to the Williams show. Um, But a lot of people that are here go to JCCS every year. So and I know for a fact of at least three people who normally go to Williams who aren't going to be there because they're going to be at JCCS. So honestly, not JCCS was cool. Yep. But I, I wouldn't rush back for another year well if you're the person who has the car in the show and has a car in the show every year the year I, you went the first year was a little bit different i think last year was a little bit better with the uh, grass event versus the concrete event i know but even with you had the car in the show that was a that weird was still, year that but was it was still year. a good show yeah it was a great show but even that was if, a weird year. even if we had a car in the show this past year i yeah cool it was a cool show i'd rather do something else Personally, I'd rather experience yep. a different show. Sure. I I enjoy the show and I go because it's not a super far drive and it's one of the best places to see old Japanese cars. But oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm not going, saying it's a bad show, but I would do something else. I'm Give going to choice. support Greg and Becky in their local show here in Williams, um, which I would pretty confidently say is one of the probably the second largest all vintage Japanese show on the in the country um, that I know of anyway. It's a great time and it's for a good cause. So I'm going to go to that. So that's all there is to it. Plus, I can bring multiple cars to this if I have multiple drivers. So I will. Because why not? Right. So I'm definitely going to that. Um, the same weekend as all that is also, I guess, the Hot Wheels convention in California, which a lot of the guys who are into old Japanese cars are also big Hot Wheels nerds. Ah. And that's why some of the people who are going who go to both shows usually are going to JCCS because it's also the same weekend as the Hot Wheels convention. All right. Yeah, whatever. Again, to each their own. I'm a giant diecast nerd. I don't think I'm quite at the level of going to the, the diecast convention, but I've been told it's a great time. So maybe some year I will. If it's is, it, 
BCCS again. Hot, Hot Wheels convention or a die gas convention? It's a Hot Wheels convention. It's put on by Mattel. Yeah, I don't I don't want to go to that. Yeah. <laughs> I I go to no, seriously, I go to a Hot Wheels convention. Uh, sorry, I go to a die gas convention. I'm not interested in just an exclusive Hot Wheels convention. So I had that same thought, but I guess there are lots of vendors and stuff that have everything. So anyway, it is what it is. I probably will never go to the Hot Wheels convention, but if I'm ever there at the same time, maybe I'll go check it out, but I'm not going to go there for my destination. So listen, I'm not shaming anybody who does. If that's your thing, that's your thing. It's just not my thing. I am. So yeah, <laughs> well, you can be mad at Andrew, not me. So anyway, but yeah, those, all those things is the same weekend, which kind of stinks. So anyway, moving on from uh, events. Oh, and, and then, then what's the and then following Rad weekend? Was, I think the following weekend. Yep. Yeah. Which so. they didn't really announce a location yet officially. If you I know, you can, can tell say, me though. Secret. No, I, I think we can say it's going to be at, um, uh, uh, yeah, the other Rad, Rad Ford. Oh. So. Racetrack? The race school, yep. At a racetrack. That would make sense to have a race school. Yes, there's a race school at the racetrack. So actually, in big Arizona news, Radford Racing School just bought Wild Horse Pass which is where the racetracks are and the drag strip. Right. Because it was all, this was the last year for everything there because they were shutting it down and it was going to become hotels and casinos and shopping centers. And Radford came in and saved it. If we're it being honest, home. that is most of Arizona. It's very true. <laughs> but Radford came in and saved it and for the foreseeable future is keeping the drag strip and all, there's like, there's five road courses right there and they're keeping them all open. So There's five? Yeah, there's four or five separate tracks. You're going to go do some track days. They do have track days there. I've been talking about this for a while. I don't currently have a track day, a car that I have eligible and ready to take to a track day. I need to make something that's ready to go to a track day. So that's all in the plans for this next coming year or two is to have a car I can go to track days with. So I all right. everybody will say, yeah, you have plenty of cars you can go to track days with, but... I am nervous to take the 944 to a track day only because of cost of parts. Um, <clears throat> Corolla wagon. The Corolla wagon is potentially part of the reason that I'm doing the suspension in the car. And part of the reason that I went with stuff that I went with uh, was to do track days with it. So, I get a little more modern wheel. With a sticky tire plenty, for it. I have plenty of wheels. Yeah. I just have, I have a set. I have a set of uh, four spoke Corolla. Sorry, four spoke Celica wheels. Yeah, uh, factory Toyota Celica wheels that I'm going to put tires on for that. So that'd be a good car for it. Yeah. Well, the the plan is eventually to make the blue Colt into a much quicker track day rally, like road rally style vehicle. Um, but in the meantime the Corolla is going to be done. That's part of the reason that when I bought all the parts, I also bought the pan hard bar and I bought the good shifter and I bought, you know, some of the other stuff I wouldn't necessarily need for a street car. So yeah, most of the pan hard bar, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, that is the plan, Andrew. So you, you blew it out of the water right there, but that oh, car cool. will be doing a few track days because I wanted something that was tiny and cheap that has, you know, at, at most 14 inch wheels so I can buy 14 inch cheap tires and uh, has cheap brakes and has upgrade parts available. So the only thing that I still need to buy probably will be a diff. So, you know, you'd be surprised with sticky tires on a dry track. That's true. Like, I don't even notice that the G20 has an open diff unless it's raining. Yeah. Well, it rains here in Arizona so much. So, yeah. A notoriously wet, wet climate here. So yes, I should get. Uh, we just we just actually broke our hundred and thirty something day without rain. It was crazy. Without measurable it's rain, pretty crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. So anyway, um, anyway moving on to events. Uh, you did your project car update things. Let me do a couple of quick project car updates. Yeah. Uh, project car update number one, 1993 Mitsubishi Eclipse. Uh, I was having some issue with the timing curve on the car and setting the timing properly. Um, it just wasn't quite right. Yeah, because this was after we did the cam sensor. We did the cam sensor and we did like base timing on it and that wasn't quite right. And I tried to adjust it a little more myself and it still wasn't quite right. 
And part of the reason was I was reading, we were both actually reading the marks on the timing cover wrong. So yeah, they're hard to see. Yeah. Well, we also, for some reason we're reading them backwards. So we had before okay. top dead center and, and after top dead center reversed. So instead of being at plus three to four, it was at yeah. negative five. Oh, that's not good. Right. So that's why it wasn't running right. So that certainly helps to get that correct. Um, I went and I talked to a good friend of ours and actually former podcast guest, Josh from Adventure Driven Design. Uh, he actually volunteered to uh, help me out because he has some extra extra good Mitsubishi diagnostic tools. Well, in um, that case, uh, he's doing some sales on ADD stuff. Yes, Adventure Driven Design so, parts for Monteros. Yeah, go check out his website. Lots of cool stuff. Uh, and a totally independent, all on his own manufacturer. So please support him. And it might take an extra day or two from a big vendor, but for, then a big vendor, but it's worth it because he's doing it all out of his garage. So yeah, super, so super anyway, good guy. Sorry. And you can trust him 100% with sending him your money. I guarantee. I, yeah. I personally guarantee it. Yeah. Um, anyway. Anyway, back to your so story. He, sorry. Yeah, he, he volunteered when I was talking about having some issues with the timing on the car. He says, oh, well, is it running? I was like, yeah, it's running. Is it running enough to bring it down here? Or should I come up there? I was like, no, I can get it to you. Because we live about, I'd say about an hour apart from each other, 45 minutes or so. So I went to his house last Thursday, I think. Wednesday or Thursday last week. And I don't know if anybody remembers, but back in the 90s and the early 2000s, Palm Pilots were a thing. And there used to be a cable that would plug into your, you know, OBD one sensor or, or, or plug on the car and then go to a Palm pilot. And it basically, it read the computer codes. Like it was the Mitsubishi diagnostic computer, the MUT one, MUT two. So it works like the program of the Mitsubishi um, diagnostic computer, but it emulates it on a Palm pilot. Well, obviously Palm pilots haven't been around for quite a long time. So he has a computer program that emulates a Palm Pilot, actually looks like a Palm Pilot on your computer screen and plugs into the onboard diagnostic port of the Eclipse. So he plugged it in and started the car and immediately it was at, um, it was out 100, you know, 180 degrees almost of timing, you know, negative versus positive. So we're like, oh, well, that's not good. <laughs> So we adjusted all of that stuff, um, made it all correct at timing now where it needs to be, get everything all set up. It's not quite right with the AC on, but I'll get to that in a second. But with the air conditioning off, car runs tip top just fine. Um, runs like it's supposed to. It runs like a 93 Eclipse should run. Everything's good. Um, back in love with how the car drives. It's technically quote unquote sold. Um, unofficially, but officially sold. So I'm not driving it a lot, but I just want to make sure that I had it back to a point where I could sell it to this person with full confidence that it was a good car because I didn't want to do it not running right. So I fixed all that. Big shouts to Josh for helping me out with that. Um, got it all taken care of. Got it all working. Car runs good. Now the issue is now when you turn the air conditioning on, the idle hunts. It goes up and comes down. It goes up. Okay. Yeah, there's another switch that like kicks in when you have the AC going on those. So in the idle air control motor, the IAC, yeah, there's three steps. There's like a like a cold start, a regular warm run, and then it has a third setting for it raises the revs when the AC is on, and it's yep. basically like a, like a coil inside the IAC, and they go bad over time. Yep. So that third coil is bad. So when it goes to that high rev, it it revs up. And then the coil is bad, so it doesn't hold it, and it drops down. And then it goes back up again, and it drops down. So it's trying to get there, so it's functioning properly, but it's actually not staying there because that IAC is bad. So I, I have ordered an IAC. Uh, there were none that were like Amazon overnight or anything, so I don't have it yet. Uh, it's coming from Rock Auto. It should be here. I think it was it was an abnormally long Rock Auto shipping time. It was like a seven-day shipping time. So is I should have a, that. Um, what brand is it? 
I don't remember. I'd have to look it up. Remember? I don't. They they didn't have the brand I wanted to buy, unfortunately. Um, I the last time I bought one, they were annoyingly expensive, like eighty dollars. That was sixty dollars for the name brand, and I I don't remember what name brand it is at this point. Um, but they had the the cheaper version that was like thirty seven. Um, which is the one they had in stock. If they had the the more if they had the name brand one, I would have gone with it. But they did not have it. So it is what it is. It'll be fine, I'm sure. So I gotta take care of that. And I could reverse one day before that, I had gone to recharge the air conditioning and I realized that it was R twelve. Yeah. Why wouldn't you think it was R twelve? Because it's a 1993 car, so I knew it was built with R twelve, but I assumed yeah. at some point it had been changed because most cars by this point have been changed. So I had to convert that to R134, um, which I didn't have the stuff to do. Big shouts to Jordan, steps on Jordan out here. He has the stuff to do that with, so we were able to convert it at his house. So Why did you convert it? Because I can't get R12. It wasn't working? No, it stopped working. Oh, oh, oh. I'm like, yeah. why, like if it's still if it's still working, then you just leave it alone. If it was forever. working, it'd be great. The car is ice cold until this summer, and it was not cold at all. At the beginning of summer, it was like like a little bit cool, but not very cool. And then by now, it was not cold. So obviously, everything leaked out. So um, I found the leak also, so it's also not going to leak out again. The O ring on the Schrader valve let go. So actually, when oh, we you took love those the, Schrader valves, man. Uh, yeah. So when we took the cap off for the high side, actually the cap was holding air pressure in, but all of the Freon, because Freon is you know smaller molecules, probably a slipperier, came through that bad O-ring on that Schrader valve um, because the cap was the only thing holding pressure. The Schrader valve wasn't holding pressure anymore. So we were able to vacuum it all out, clean it all out, put the new PAG oil in with the, for the R134. We also put some dye in just in case it did leak. Um, and then recharged it with our 134. It's nice and icy cold again. Also, man, I keep forgetting everything. That same moment in time, I put a radio in the car for the first time since I've owned it. Because again, cars being sold, I want it to be. Why do I do this? Why do I wait until I've sold a car to make it perfect? Doesn't make any know. sense. Doesn't make any sense. Anyway, so I put a radio in the car. So it has a nice bluetooth stereo in there now that works great and uh, the speakers all function properly and everything is looking good and the car is running good i just need that iac valve uh car's running good air is nice and ice cold car's ready to go um it's been sold it's just waiting on that iac valve and i put a windshield claim in because i have a cracked windshield and i'll get a new windshield and get a new iac valve and then it's off to its new owner so I won't say too much yet, but staying in the family, so it's not going far. So, um, not not actual family, but like family of the podcast. So, okay. it'll still be around. Um, yeah, so that's the eclipse. So that car is going well. Uh, what else is happening? Oh, the other thing is annoying. Your newest vehicle. I I bought a motorcycle talked about this ad nauseum past few weeks in love with the thing i've done probably about 700 miles on it already which is impressive considering that's been only early morning rides <laughs> it's been so hot out so i've done about 700 miles on it this past sunday naomi left in the morning to go for a bicycle ride and i was just sleeping in a little bit it was like 6 a.m i was like oh it's it's cool enough out it was only like 82 degrees I was like, I should go for a motorcycle ride. It's like, I bet four till four is something going on. So I looked and it was their air cooled day on Sunday. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I'll go check out some Volkswagens. Maybe somebody will be down there that I know. So I rode down to four till four uh, and I ran into a, a kid I know. Um, actually, if you, I'll give him a quick shout out. He's a pretty good photographer. He goes on Instagram as Spiffy. So he's S I P P P F F Y. This. One letter's got more letters than it should, but I'll look it up later. Um, I ran into him down there with his FB RX-7, and he was down there taking pictures of the air-cooled. So I chatted with him for a while. So I wound up being there later than I wanted to be. It was much later than planned time of being down there, grabbing a coffee, drinking coffee, and leaving. 
So I talked to him for a solid 45 minutes or so, then went, got a coffee, sat down, drank a coffee, went back to the motorcycle, and it wouldn't start. Now, sure. I bought a 2022 motorcycle because I'm, I, I just wanted a reliable motorcycle. I didn't want another project vehicle. I wanted something I could get in, it's fuel injected, or get on, and it's fuel injected, and go. Wouldn't start. All right, this is annoying. So I'm cranking it, cranking it, cranking it. Finally, it starts. Oh, great. It started. Sitting there idling. I'm putting my riding jacket on, put my helmet on. It sputters and dies. Huh. Annoying. Go to crank it over again. Won't start. Just cranks, cranks, cranks. Like, God damn it. So I turn the key off. I turn the key on. Now, normally when you turn the key on, you hear the fuel pump prime. I don't hear a fuel pump prime. I'm like, hmm. That's not good. Turn the key off. Turn the key on. No fuel pump prime. I do this like a dozen times and I hit the fuel pump prime. I'm like, oh, great. There's a fuel pump. I'm going to prime it. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to ride home and figure it out. Get it running. It's running long enough to die again. The fuck. All right. Now what to do. So I'm sitting down there and I'm getting frustrated and I'm looking on the internet and a common issue with these is the fuel pump relay goes bad or alternatively, when they're assembled, they put too much dielectric grease on them and they just don't work and get clean them off. So I dig under the seat. I find where these two relays are. One is for the ECU. One is for the fuel pump. I take them off and yeah, they're absolutely, it looks like they dunked them in dielectric grease. So the only thing I have on me is a, a receipt paper in my, in my pockets. So I take the receipt paper out and I clean all the dielectric grease off. And I switch them around so that I can, you know, find out if it's the, a bad relay or not. The, the identical relays, both five pin, you know, Bosch style relays. So I switch them around and I turn the key on, no fuel pump. Okay. Well, that wasn't my problem. I put my hand on the relays and I turn them on. Sorry, I didn't do this yet. So now I'm frustrated. Play a little more. I get started again. Perfect. I'm going to try to get home. I made it, about a, made it about a block and died again. Great. So I called Naomi, who's now home from her ride. And I was like, hey, would you mind coming down here uh, with the car? And we can go to AutoZone and get a couple new relays. Because maybe maybe the relay is bad. You know, and if one's bad, one runs the ECU, one runs the fuel pump. If I switched them around, I'm sure with that an ECU, it's not going to run either. So we go... And I go buy two relays at AutoZone. They're like six bucks, whatever. We come back, I put the relays in, bike doesn't start. So I'm like, well, the only thing left is a fuel pump. That's all there is to it. It's the, it's the only thing it can be is a fuel pump because everything else is yeah, it's fine. So or it's got bad gas. <sighs> yeah, probably. Probably something in the gas tank is my guess. Clogged the fuel pump up and burnt it out maybe. I don't know. I'm incredibly frustrated because, again, I bought this 2022 motorcycle to have no issues. So I get the bike back. Thankfully, Jordan happened to be moving the same day, and he wasn't terribly far away, and he already had a trailer, a borrowed trailer and a borrowed truck, and the trailer had nothing on it at the time. So he came by and rescued me, picked the bike up with the trailer, brought the bike back to my house. I called the local Royal Enfield dealer on Tuesday when they opened, and made an appointment for Thursday today to have it fixed. So I was going to borrow my neighbor's trailer, who has a motorcycle trailer, and bring it over to the dealership. In the interim, I was on the internet reading about other people who had the same issue. And there is a known issue with these, and it is a warranted claim. But I was reading, and there are two local owners... Uh, one whose bike is currently at the same dealer I was going to, because there's only two dealers in town, and one whose bike was there. The one whose bike is there, his bike has been there for three months. The one whose bike was there, his bike was there for five months. What? And they gave him the runaround, and they tried to charge both of them and say that they burnt out the fuel pump by having sediment in the tank. And they uh, How do you, almost a thousand dollars. So excuse me, what? Yeah, it became a huge fight between for them a and motorcycle the fuel tank. Yes. 
for a fuel pump on a motorcycle is a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars, yeah, nine hundred and something bucks. So in, I was what? I wound up messaging these guys on the internet from the local owners group, and they're both like, "Yeah, don't bring your motorcycle to the dealer because it's going to be nothing but a headache, and the part is available online. They're going to fight back and forth with you because they get to call." Royal Enfield and they have to get the repair approved and then they're really slow at it and they don't care about you at all because you're there on a $5,000 motorcycle and it just becomes a whole thing. He's like, and then the guy whose bike has been there for, was there for five months said, and then all of a sudden the part was on back order and the other guy's like, yeah, they, he's, it was literally just last week. They finally said, all right, Enfield's going to cover it, but the part's on back order till no release date. I was like, all right, well, this sounds annoying. I don't want to even deal with Why that. Why wouldn't you like, just, okay. Because now I'm going to have to bring the bike there on a trailer. And if it's going to be there for even more than like a few days, I'm going to get mad Hold and on. go pick it up on a trailer again. Yeah. This, I, well, okay. These other people. Yes. Are they charging them storage? I don't understand. They're not charging them storage. They just don't care. About I would just bikes. pick up. I would just pick the bike up and fix it myself. I don't so understand. Both, it's not both of them. Both of them suffered from having more than one bike and it's summertime in Arizona. So they weren't okay. as concerned about it. But Because to me, that's like, all right, I don't care that much about being covered in a warranty. I'll just fix it myself because correct. it's less than $100. Correct. So It's not like the thing needs a new engine. Correct. So this is what my decision was yesterday after talking to these guys. I was like, I'm not even going to annoy myself with this process. Because I just know it's going to be frustrating and I'm going to have to trailer the bike there and then go back and trailer it back. And it's going to be a whole thing because it's going to be in pieces during their diagnostic. And they're going to try charging your diagnostic fee. And it's going to be a $150 diagnostic fee or something ridiculous like that. So I'm not even going to bring it to them. I'm just going to do it myself. So I did a quick look up online just to make sure it wasn't something more complicated than I thought it was. And it's not. It's literally the seat comes off, which comes off with the key. There's two 10 millimeter bolts to hold the gas tank on. There's one plastic fuel line fitting, and then there's two evap hoses that aren't even clamped oh, on. You plastic fuel line fittings. Dude, it's the same fitting as the Mercor. I was looking at it, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you know a guy. Now. I know a guy, yeah. Also, I'm not going to break this one. It's not 35 years old. So anyway, it's literally maybe a 10-minute process to take the tank off. It's not a big deal. it take more time to siphon the gas out of it because, of course, it has a full tank. So... Uh, where was I with that? So anyway, I looked online. There's a couple places have the part. It's a Royal Enfield. It's built in India. Most of the parts are out of India. So most of them were like, well, the part will be there September 1st. Now, it's that's two weeks away. That's not yeah. acceptable to me either right now. I just want it back. I want it to put it together. So I did a little more researching, and I found out what the actual part number for the fuel pump inside the assembly is. Because you can split the assembly really easily. In fact, you're supposed to split it in order to change the filter. But Royal Enfield doesn't sell just the internal pump. They sell the whole external you know, assembly with the pump inside of it. So I did a little more digging, and I found the number of the actual fuel pump. And then I found a company out of Poland that does upgraded ones that last longer and are run cooler to replace your stock Enfield one with. And the stock Enfield one is like eighty dollars with the whole housing, and this upgraded better pump is only forty bucks, and it comes with a new filter element. So, ah. and it's out of Poland, so it'll be here next week <laughs> instead of two weeks. So, <laughs> win win. Um, that should be here. It's a direct fit. There's no fiddling around with it. You just put it in, plug it in. I was looking at reviews of it. It's fine. So that's going to happen. So. The side story with this whole debacle is I'd asked my neighbor if I could use their motorcycle trailer. And she said, absolutely. It's kind of buried. I'll have to get it out of the yard. I was like, all right, well, I apologize if you want to do it. She's like, no, no, not a big deal. I'll get it out. I was like, okay, she does have a broken board on it because it's a, it's not really a motorcycle trailer. It's like a utility trailer. One of those Home Depot ones. It's like a, I think five by eight with the wooden slat floors. And one of the boards is broken. It's not going to affect my using it to bring the motorcycle to the dealer. So I'm like, whatever, no big deal. I was like, but as thanks for using the trailer and your efforts for taking it out of the backyard, I'll replace that wooden board for you. It's just a standard eight foot long by 
five inch wide piece of wood, you know, one by five by eight feet. So I went out and bought a board and I'm not using the trailer now, but she already dug it out. And I was like, well, you dug it out. I'm going to put a board on it for you anyway, because you didn't have to dig it out in the middle of the summer heat for me not to use it for me not to replace the board. So I went out and I got a board and I got the hardware to attach it with. Now the problem is it's an eight foot long board and it goes into two C channels on either end. So you can't just slot it in in the middle. You have to like bend the board to get it inside. So of course I was doing that actually just before recording tonight and I put a floor jack under the trailer so I could lift the jack up and then slide one end of the board under the C channel and then stand on the other end of the board to bend the wood to get it into the C channel. And of course it snapped. So you can't bend it far enough to get it in the C channel at either end. You gotta soak it with water. Apparently you gotta soak it with water. Yeah. Also, I noticed that all the other boards are cut short on both ends and they don't actually touch each end. So they're not quite eight feet. So yeah. I'll probably have to do both things. I go buy another board. Thankfully they're only nine bucks. I go buy another eight foot long board, cut a couple inches off the end and uh, get it nice and wet and bend it and put it in. But did not go as, as planned tonight. So now I have to do it again tomorrow, <laughs> but live and learn, right? I'm not a woodworking guy. I don't know any better. But anyway, see, so yeah, the motorcycle is dead in the yard. I'm going to put the cover over it and just forget about it till the park comes in. And uh, things, dead in the the yard, things dead in the yard is just my lifestyle, you know? Um, hopefully the fuel pump just fixes the problem and there's no issues. If it doesn't, I'm just going to be frustrated and I'll probably wind up selling the thing and buying something different. Who knows? We'll see. I do like the bike and I want to use it. I just am frustrated by this whole thing. And it seems to be like there's a a known problem with a, one particular run of 22s and I happen to have one of them. So <laughs> it, it did stall on me on the way home once earlier in the week and wouldn't fire right back up. So I assume that was probably this problem starting. I didn't realize it. And I thought it was weird that it stalled. And I was like, that's annoying. I'll keep an eye on that. Well, unfortunately keeping an eye on it was the next ride. So it turned into a, a, a two hour ride turned into a, six or seven hour ordeal waiting for Jordan to get there with the trailer and the whole thing. And thankfully though, I broke down next to a taco shop that had margaritas and there you go. $2 and $2 street tacos. So we made the best. Granted of it. that's every block in Arizona. So not in Scottsdale, <laughs> not is it's get, getting $2 tacos in Scottsdale is a challenge because Scottsdale is a little too fancy for that. But this is a, it was a very authentic, uh, taco shop. They even had the, the meat sitting there just rotating on a spit and they shaved it off to put in your taco. So it was, it's quite legit. So made up for the annoyingness by eating tacos. So, and, and obviously a big shout out to Naomi for coming, saving me and for steps on Jordan for coming down and saving me with the trailer and him coming with his wife and the kids and nobody complaining and just helped me out. So good stuff. But that's, those are my project updates this week. It's been, anno- been an annoying week. I think it's all well, we got. The, the eclipse is better, so that's all that matters. Yeah. So very right, cool. All right. So Auto Off Topic podcast on Facebook, Auto Off Topic on Instagram, uh, Scale Autocast. I've been putting some stuff on there. I've been trying to do some videos. I saw I did a couple of reels. A, I've added a couple of pictures couple the past reels. couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. I keep posting it in my stories on my page and reminding people we have it. We've got actually a few followers from that in the past couple of days. So that's good. I'm trying to build that yeah. page up a little bit. So, And uh, follow me, uh, Race and Anger, on Instagram. And uh, still trying to make threads a thing, but who knows? Anyway, where can they find you, Brad? Listen, th- threads is going more positive than Twitter, right? Excuse me, X. It sure so. is. Um, I have not joined threads yet, but they can find me, of course, on scale autocast, um, and on auto off topic where we need to post more there on Instagram and, and my personal Instagram of T S I S S three five zero, where I am probably most active. All right, cool. As always, keep your guys analog and aim for the roses.